I saw a YouTube video of Dr. Marrow talking about trauma, and it was so um, it was so down to earth, and yet so accurate and educational. But I thought this is a great person to have speak about conference, and the fact that she works in the juvenile justice system among youth of color, I know really is something that resonates with many of us. And uh, part of our populations include this group. And so um, I would like to invite to the stage Dr. Moni Brown. opportunity to be here and to be able to speak to so many individuals who got to choose to come today and to listen. And, and I think that's really important because um, one of the things that I think I try to work really hard in is I work in systems. And I work in systems with uh, young people, but more importantly, I work in systems with uh, staff and with administrators. <laughs> And my met, I can't say that if I, you know, was initially coming to do training, that they would all, you know, be standing on their heads saying, I just can't wait to go to trauma training with Monique. That's, that wasn't it. Actually, probably in 2000, I guess it was 2006, when I first started doing work in the area of trauma responsive practice in juvenile justice systems. And I was doing the work because I was, at that time, with the Ohio Department of Youth Services, and I had been um, elevated to the position of Deputy Director of Treatment and Rehab Services for the entire state. So all of our juvenile facilities were my responsibility related to medical, mental health, social services, education, um, sex offender programming, chaplaincy services, volunteer services, food service. Pretty much anything that was a programmatic area was my responsibility. And at the time, um, when I took that position, I, I was uh, at that time relatively young. And I had only been doing, I mean, I had been licensed at that time a total of seven years. And um, I was informed about day two that one of the reasons they selected me is because our department had been sued in all of the areas that I was now responsible for. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, so this is interesting. And that they really wanted me to come up with strategies to deal with all of those areas. And so I thought, well, goodness, I, I, I'm a psychologist. I know mental health. But you're saying health care, so I'm responsible for the, um, the, the uh, physician who is over all health care. I'm responsible for the superintendent of schools. I mean, these aren't things that I do. But I had to find a way for us. I, I went back to, so what are we being sued for? And we were being sued for failure to provide services. We were being sued for conditions of confinement, which means that really they felt as though that our, our programs were not suitable for kids, that we were more punitive than we needed to be, that we weren't, um, that there were lots of things happening to kids while they were in our care. And so I, I decided that what we would do is, is to, to focus on kind of a target. And at that time, we had issues around um, kids that were being secluded on a regular basis. Our seclusion rates were extremely high. Our restraint rates were relatively high. Um, we had, um, in addition to all those other things, of course, as you can imagine, uh, staffing is an issue. So. Many of our staff were out on what we call occupational injury leave, which means that they were hurt in the line of duty, or at least they got a doctor to indicate that they were hurt in the line of duty, because we had that too. Bureau of Workmen's compensation rates were high, so I said, well, what can we do? 
And so I went to a training called Creating Violence-Free, Coercion-Free Mental Health Programs, because at the time, juvenile justice was not really talking about trauma. They weren't talking about therapeutic interventions. Um, this was on the cusp of kind of like the super predator age. So we really weren't talking about those things. So I sat and you know went through this uh, training, which was led by Joan Gleese, and um, I took an entire multidisciplinary team of individuals. And what we came up with was, if we can address trauma in the young people that we serve, we are more likely to reduce the number of incidents in our programs. And that would be a win as a beginning. And so that's really how I started doing this work, was to figure out how do I translate what I'm learning about mental health facilities into the justice facilities? Because really, they're the same kids. The same kids that are in mental health programs or the same kids who are in juvenile justice programs who are the same kids who are in child welfare programs. They truly are system-involved kids. And they belong to all of us. And so utilizing these strategies to me seemed to be far more universal. So that's kind of where I begin kind of in my, in my journey. And, and over the course of the last uh, couple of decades, I've really come to every day understand more about what it means to be trauma responsive. And I recognize that for me, it means that when I wake up every day, I have to wake up in the mindset of being trauma responsive. I have to recognize that every person that I greet um, is an individual that potentially has their own experiences. And 90% of the time, I think I'm pretty good at when somebody comes at me in some kind of way, I'm able to look back at them and say, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to respond aggressively. I'm going to just innately understand that there's something at the core of this person that is probably in need of something. And so I just listen. So that's really kind of where how I approach life. So I've had the opportunity to work, and I just dearly love working with justice uh, systems. Um, I, I am here and, have, and will be here in California, and particularly working with LA County Probation for probably at least the next three years, although our last conversation, they said, we hope that we can have a very long relationship. And I thought, hmm, I'm not sure how long that is, but it sounded very long. So we understand that reform is a process. So I'm also a member of something called the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Anybody familiar with NCTSN? Great, more hands than normal. So. NCTSN, the National Center, is located here at, uh, well, one of them, at UCLA, and we also have um, a second coordinating center at Duke University. And the National Child Traumatic Stress Network is really, the mission is to be able to spread an understanding of childhood trauma and to intervene in for services uh, for youth and families in a way that helps those systems become more trauma responsive. So uh, I, that, that's what I do. This is a wonderful picture that was drawn by, not drawn, that was taken um, and developed by a young person um, in a Rhode Island um, training school, which I always thought was interesting that they call them training schools or boys programs. We have people that drop, try to drop their kids off, like how do you get in? I'm like, you don't want your child to meet the admission standards for our program. So. Um, but that, this is a, I think a wonderful, what I liked about it is it really to me I, was a pictorial representation of what I hope for kids, is that they really will find their wings, that they really will find that thing that lifts them. And so um, that's really our goal there. I always, in every training that I do, I, I provide a little note that Self-care is important. So Louise is talking about that room. Whether that's the place that your self-care or you need to get up and walk, feel free to do that. Because when I train, one of the one of the primary things I like to communicate, and I think uh, Dr. Hardy communicated at the end, was I have to get you to connect with my message. And if I can't get you in the space 
that you need to be in to understand what my kids experience, then I'm not able to get you to consider there might be an alternative way of doing what we do. And so in order to do that, I find I use a lot of video. And in an hour, I'm not going to show nearly as much video as I normally do, but there will be some video. I'm also a person that I, if a person puts bullet points up, my brain goes on like sleep mode. So I have lots of imagery. So that's a part of who I am as well. So if you find that there's anything that I talk about or anything that you see that is distressing for you, that you do what you need to do to take care of yourself. So how many of you have seen the movie Freedom Riders? Kind of a few, good. So Freedom Riders was a, a, a video that came, or a movie that came out when I was initially developing a curriculum. And I probably should have said, I developed a curriculum called Think Trauma, a training for staff in juvenile justice and residential settings. And my, the reason for developing that training was I, want, I knew that I needed staff to be on board with me. And I couldn't have them be on board with me if they didn't understand what I was talking about. If I said trauma, staff would probably, basically their response was, oh, what do you want us to do, coddle the kid? I mean, he murdered somebody. And so after a period of time when I was kind of messaging and going around, my new name became Dr. Hug and Thug. That was it. <laughs> or Dr. Hug and Thug. And I said, not really. I, 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 my goal is to get you to understand that kids need boundaries. Nobody's saying don't provide boundaries or structure. Kids with trauma histories need more boundaries. But boundaries are different than putting them in situations that are harmful. So we're talking about boundaries. So this particular, um, uh, like I said, video came out at that time. I was just really intrigued by the um, work that uh, was happening in terms of, of, of this teacher. So this teacher's name is Erin Grohl, and as many of you may know, this is based on the true story um, of her life and her experiences here with kids in the Long Beach area. And so this is Erin's um, first day on the job as a teacher, and she is an English teacher. And she is so excited about her first day of work, probably a lot like what Dr. Hardy was saying about his students. I just love working with kids. And she comes equipped with everything the university had to offer. How many of you have felt thoroughly equipped by your degree to work with the populations of kids that you have? Probably not. I mean, I have a degree from the Ohio State University. <laughs> and while I take a lot of pride in my Buckeyes, I have to say that they didn't teach me a whole lot about how to work with these kids, despite the fact that I was there forever. So <laughs> she also, I think, brings kind of her knowledge, and then she has to learn to translate. So we're going to watch this um, classroom scene. And it is of Erin on her very first day. So if we could watch that, I want you to observe the dynamics and we're going to have a little conversation about that. My name is Erin Gruel. Welcome to Freshman English. <laughs> I give this bitch a week. Hi. Um, okay, Brandy Ross, Gloria Muniz. Alejandro Santiago, Andre Bryant, Eva Benitez, Eva, not Eva, Eva. I have to go to the bathroom. Okay, uh, make sure that you yeah, take I know. Uh, Ben Samuels. That white boy hoping he's in the wrong room. I gotta get out of here. Cindy Nagore. Right here. Is that correct? Jamal Hill. Man, what am I doing in here? This old ghetto ass class has got people in here looking like a bad rerun of cops. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Shoot. Are you Jamal? <laughs> yeah. Well, for some reason they have you registered in this class. Man, that's some bullshit. It's the dumb class, cuz. 
Means you're too dumb. <laughs> man, say it to my face, cuz. I just did. You see what I mean? <laughs> dumb. Man, I know you ain't talking to me. Um, okay. Ooh. Look, homie, I beat that ass, homeboy. Can you please sit back Look, down? Look, I got your spot on the scene. That's why you're over there wagging your tongue. Please sit back in your seat. Look, your spot is good as gold. I don't know why you keep wasting your time coming to practice with them two-year-old nights. You don't know nothing about me, cuz. Okay. Broke down my whole situation. Come on. Tell you my face now, right? Uh, Quick, take this shit. Don't fuck ass down. Sit your fuck ass down. I'm running ass down. Sit your ass down. What's up, homie? Excuse me, may I please get some help in here? So when you think about that, I often ask, you know, Seth, you know, what is it about these young people that's so familiar? What did you see that reminds you of the young people that you work with? You get maybe two responses. I, I, t I tend to be one that needs a call and response, so, um, yeah. The struggle. Huh? The struggle. The struggle. Okay. What else did you see? That reminds you of the young people. Not meeting expectations, the fighting, the level of, yep. That the thought of not caring, which we have a word, word for that, they're callous and unemotional traits. So we'll be talking about those. But that, that, those are the variables that we often see. That what we might call aggression that maybe really is rage, that's what you see, okay? The fact that so they're so disrespectful. I love when people say that, I'm waiting for an audience member to say, they're so disrespectful. And you realize they're disrespectful to the teacher. They're disrespectful though also to each other. And when you really look at the word disrespect, I asked you know people, what is it, what is the purpose of disrespect? Why does one person disrespect another? What is the goal of that? Have you ever really thought about that? Huh? Power. So when I say, when I disrespect you, my goal is to disempower you. Now, the kids I work with get that very clearly. He dissed me. If you diss me, I can respond with any level of aggression and rage I want to. Because you're trying to disempower me. And that's a, a very key piece for the young people that I work with. Because disempowerment is their life. And so their goal often is to figure out ways to re-empower self. So when we look at the young people, you do see a lot of that. And unfortunately, though, you also hear some internalized messages if you listen carefully. So the young man said, what am I doing in this class? And his buddy says, this is a dumb class. And you think, well, you were in a dumb class too. <laughs> so there's a sense that we accept that somehow we are lesser, that we don't have skill set. And it becomes internalized to the level that they will repeat it, almost. So you begin to hear some of that in the young people. And I mean, when we kind of think about this word, you know, disrespect, um, if you listen to the young lady in the beginning, the teacher says, Eva, and she says, Ava, not Eva. And you think about that. And I recognize, you know, my name is Monique. It's spelled traditionally. But I get called Monica. I get called Monica. All kinds of, you know, unique versions of this. And to be honest, you know, I go places, I have five kids. My youngest told me, you know, mom, you know, she called you Monica. And I said, I know. Because it doesn't matter. 
And I actually quote what Dr. Heidi said. You know, when you think about a name, when you think about your name, sometimes that has a different meaning for some people than it does for others. And so for her, her name to be mispronounced feels disrespectful. And she has a need to correct that. That's important to her. And so when I look at this, you know, I tell my kids, you know, I'm, I'm whoever they need me to be. I'm not going to correct them in the moment. That's not important to me. The conversation is. So when we think about this construct, I like to look at this disrespect, disempowerment, and all the ways that our kids attempt to re-empower themselves. So disrespect, disempowerment are huge words for me. They're, they're huge concepts, and I look for them in almost every relationship and conversation I have, because I think it's really at the root of what many people are trying to work through. So it's important. So when we look at the, you know, this particular thing, we have the characters, of course, but then we also have the staff. And you wonder, you know, what do these staff believe about the kids? What did you, what did you, what do you think they believe about the kids? What are two words? Lost. They're lost. Hopeless. That they're hopeless. Okay. They, they can't change. That's, that's what you hear, you know, and then you hear Erin, and she's like, maybe if I just do my job, they'll be lining up the door. And they're just looking at her like, that's lovely, dear. Um, that'll change. We'll just give it a little time. But the reality of it is, people who do people work, all of you that, that decided that you'd you know, rather go into people work, you didn't do it because you were going to get this huge paycheck. You did it because you really, at your core, believe possibly in some way that you could impact the lives of others. That's why we do what we do. And then that core belief and probably ability gets all messed up when we go off to school. Because then we learn all these other constructs that forget about the relationship and the value of those things. But when you look at her at this point, she's saying, you know, maybe if I just do my, you know, what I'm supposed to, it's gonna work. And so she's very optimistic. And so I wonder, if you think about it, how many people know people who are those administrators? Do you know those people? Hopefully you're not saying you are those people, but you know those people. And then, then you think about the fact that at one point those administrators were Aaron. At one point those teachers who were highly punitive and had a zero tolerance policy, they really did have a heart to teach. But they didn't have the tools they needed to reach the populations of young people that they were asked to serve. And so I look at them and say, I know you have a heart to serve. I just need to help you with the tools. That's really what I think about. So, and part of all of that, in my training, I asked staff to think about what do you think contributes to the way these young people think, feel, and behave? And really, this is about understanding behavior in context. And most of the time, they will spout the very same things that they believe about families. They come from bad families. They come from bad communities. They, um, you know, whatever it is, that's, that's their reason. But when you really look at it, you know, that there, it really points back to the badness about those areas, as well as some innate piece about that child. And so we begin by looking at what are all your belief systems that you have, so that throughout the course of training, we can begin to address those. That's really my goal, is to help you to think differently. So, we're going to assume, you know, this is Erin. Erin came, you know, into this class and she wanted to teach English. And she realized pretty quickly that what she learned was not going to be a satisfactory way of doing that. And so she says, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give each and every one of my students a composition book. I teach English. Let me, let me give this a try. And she says, 
I don't care what you write in the book. As long as you write something in those compositions of every single day, you're going to get credit. So I think that's a unique instruction. And I and people always ask me, you know, Doc, I understand our kids are traumatized, but like, what do you want us to do about it? What does you know? What are we supposed to do? And I start by saying, what she just did is a trauma responsive practice. And many people say, yeah, she, you know, she gave them a voice. Well, yeah, that's important. A voice is important. But she didn't even say they have to talk about themselves. She just said you had to write something in it each and every day, and you will get credit. What she did was give them some degree of uh, ability to be successful and to be able to achieve based upon what they had to contribute. There wasn't a judgment for that. The second instruction she gave was probably the most important. She said, if you want me to read whatever you write, leave those here in the slot cabinet. Otherwise, you can take those with you every day, bring them back, I'll flip through just to see if there's anything on the page, and you'll get credit. So in that second instruction, she now empowers the individuals to make a decision about what they share. And so when I look at you know, programs and agencies, a lot of times when I walk through the door, they'll say, well, why do you want to see you know, our facility? I said, because I, I need to see you in action. Because the way in which a child comes in, the way in which they move through your, your areas tells me a lot about what you believe about them. And so when you're looking at this, I often say, that kid needs to have some choice about what they do, and that's important. So this is Erin about four months into her time at this high school, and she's done a lot of wacky things to try and engage these kids. And so she's come to a point where it is parent-teacher conference day, and she is <laughs> ecstatic about getting to meet the parents of her students. You know, she's She's had her husband like help her paint big signs, and she's got cookies and punch, and she's got all kinds of stuff. She's thrilled, okay? And she walks, she sits and she waits, and she looks out the door, and she sees parents looking like they're coming her way, only to pass her door, go to another classroom. And it, you realize that even in the four months, she still doesn't quite understand all of the factors that impact her students. Not a single parent came, for whatever reason. And one of the things I tell people is, it is our obligation to engage families in a way that helps them to enter our doors. It is not our obligation to say, we have visitation on Sunday between 1 and 3. I don't care that you work those times. If you really cared about your kid, you would be here. That isn't exactly what I hoped for. And so, but she's, you know, she's hopeful. So after she waits for a period of time, she finally decides, I'm just going to pull out um, these journals. So she, she goes over and she looks in that law cabinet. She's smiling because if you look at the number of journals, it suggests almost every single kid left them. That's because she gave them a choice. It was their decision. And she allowed them to trust her enough to be able to share. So when we look at this, we're gonna we're gonna watch this next clip because I want you to listen and experience what it is that she reads in the journals. And I'm gonna give you one more self-care alert because this is far more graphic than the very first um, clip. So take care of yourself. So we can go ahead and start the video. In every war, there is an enemy. I watched my mother being half beaten to death and watched as blood and tears streamed down her face. I felt useless and scared and furious at the same time. I could still feel the sting of the bell on my back and my legs. One time, he couldn't pay the rent. And that night, he stopped us on the street and pointed to the concrete. He said, pick a spot. Clyde was 
was my boy. He had my back plenty of times. We was like one fist, me and him, one army. Heavy. Shit right here. Nobody jumps now. We gotta practice. Cause this, this got power. You shoot it, it breaks. Like I sat there until the police came. But when they come, all they see is a dead body, a gun, and a nigga. They took me to juvenile hall. First night was the scariest. Inmates banging on the walls, throwing up their gang signs, yelling out who they were, where they from. I cried my first night. Can't never let nobody know that. I spent the next few years in and out of cells. Every day I worry, when will I be free? He says, to the soldiers and me, it's all worth it. Dodging bullets, pulling triggers, it's all worth it. You know, that was a really hard phrase for me to understand. How could, what was it, what was worth it? You know, what was it that you were accomplishing by that? What did you get out of that? And I think earlier we heard, you know, you recognize that those are potentially parts of a life that are also a part of a community or family or group, and that that can understand. He's also a little different, and we're gonna talk about, you know, because of his experiences. So, when you looked at that video clip, would you would you think that there's anything, today we're talking about trauma, is there anything in that clip that you would consider potentially traumatic? <laughs> potentially. Well, was it? yeah, all of it, okay? So we, we recognize that our kids come to us with a lot of experiences, and they are dealing and balancing a lot. And then we have expectations about sitting still and being respectful and being able to focus and yet there's they have so many other competing things that are happening for them so yes um, those are you know many potentially traumatic events but i want to kind of take a moment and demonstrate a little bit i want to point two things out here so we talked about respect disrespect disempowerment those things also are linked very closely to the construct of dignity. And so if you listen to this clip, you hear over and over very similar themes. So the, the young woman that um, said that her father was the camp, in the camps in Cambodia, and if you listen to what she said was, where they stripped him of his dignity, and now he hurts my mom and me. So a different culture, but you hear the idea of that stripping of one's dignity being so, so um, impactful. And the need or desire to regain that or to re-empower self may mean that an individual acts out on those closest to them. And so you recognize that dignity and respect are so critically important for everyone that we will often do almost anything to gain that. And so I think it's critically important when you ask that question, you know why? I mean, I ask the same question. We, we give our kids state-issued tennis shoes. And if you've never been in a facility, they're black, they're ugly, they're Velcro. No kid would be caught dead in the street in the shoes we give them. But I watched one kid scuff the other kid's black state-issued tennis shoes. And that kid pummeled that kid to the point where we had to have him sent to the hospital with a concussion. We were worried about traumatic brain injury over a shoe. And of course, I'm, you know, this happened about three days into my new position three days after getting licensed for the first time. And they said, oh, doc, we need you to speak with that kid. And I thought, okay, well. And so I said, okay, well, what happened? He said, oh, um, he, uh, he bumped me. And I thought, 
No, I mean, I didn't mean to, I don't know which institute you're talking about. You know, I'm just, this, this kid you pummeled. Yeah, he bumped me. And it, I, there was nothing in me that could understand that response. Not a single thing. I said, I mean, he disrespected me. And I come from the sticks and stones that break my bones, but words would never hurt me kind of little things. But you realize for that kid, what he was saying was, if I allow him to bump me today, he's going to perceive in me a vulnerability that's going to allow him to do something else to me tomorrow. So I respond now. And years it took me to understand that basic construct, because this kid had been so demoralized, so devalued, that that was important to him. So when we look at all of these different things, that construct you will find, we will consider, we will continue to move forward with. The other thing that is important about this is when we look at the young people that we serve, if we take, we're gonna take one kid, the kid on the park bench. In that little tiny clip, what are all the things that occurred to him that were potentially traumatic? So you think about, this is the young man who's sitting with his friend on the, on the park bench. You got, he watched his friend shoot himself, right? Okay. What else happened to him? Just shut up. He ended up in juvenile detention. Do you just walk to juvenile detention? No. He had to go through the process of being arrested, which, how old do you think that kid was? He looked six. He probably was 10 or 11, okay? So can you imagine being 10 or 11 and being arrested, placed in a squad car, and taken to juvenile detention? Can you imagine how challenging, that scary that would be? So that's three things that happened to him. What else do you think happened that we know of in that? Yes. So he's sitting with that dead body across his lap from, if you looked at the landscape, it went from day to night. So we're talking hours, okay? What else? So he had access to the gun, but in, can we go back one step? He's 10 or 11. How many of you guys have 10 or 11 year old kids? What do you think about that? Why, do, why does a 10 or 11 year old have a gun? Right, if you listen to what he said was, no one jumps us now. So you have a kid that's <laughs> been bullied in some way. So that's five different things, okay? Then he ends up, you know, when you think about detention, you think about juvenile all. He goes in, he's with a bunch of other kids that he doesn't know, that look much bigger, much more threatening, and he's scared out of his mind. And he said, what does he say he does his first night? He said, I cried my first night, and then he says, and I'll never let anybody know that. And then that's the same kid that says, in and out of cells, when will I be free? There's one other thing that if you listen closely was a part of his experience in that day. What is anything else that was memorable about what he said? The police treat a black boy with a gun and uh -huh. a dead body and police roll up. Right. So he says, when the police come, all they see is a gun, a dead body, and a nigga. That's what they said. And I often think to myself, you know, and I ask people, say, oh, you know, that boy, he must have had a lot of experience. This is, however, this is a 16 or 17 year old kid telling the story of his 11 year old self. So at that point in his life, he is reflecting back on that. And of course, he says a journey of six more years. And so I'm sure that the police didn't say anything like that when they showed up. But you can see that his, what has happened to him, what he has seen, has helped him to recognize that his race, his color, makes a difference. And that that also places him in positions that where people mistreat or abuse other kinds of things to him. So we think about that young child, five or six different things happening in that particular point. So, when we think about that, when you think about all the kids you serve, many of them have significant trauma histories. In this particular clip, one of the other pieces we heard about is something that I think is a silent experience for kids like this. When we see kids like this, many people think, thugs don't breathe. I remember when somebody actually told me that. Like, 
I said, do you do any, um, you know, like grief counseling, grief work with the kids around their experiences? And they're like, grief? Why would we? I mean, they're, this is just their life. This is just how this is. I mean, they don't grieve. I said, no, 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 no. We don't allow them to grieve. We don't, we don't have space for them to grieve. We've got all these other grief groups that happen over there in the behavioral health system for kids who experience these same things. But we believe this kind of callous, unemotional traits means that these kids just are used to it. They're capable. So the other thing that I developed is a curriculum called Trauma and Grief Components Therapy for Adolescents. I co-developed that with some colleagues of mine for kids, incarcerated kids. What we found was the point at which kids began to deal with their grief was the point at which we began to understand emotion. They could connect around grief. That became very important. And most of them said, you know what? I don't think anybody else ever gave a damn about what I had experienced in life. And so we start talking about how many losses. So that one kid that says, to you, he was just another dead body on the street corner. But to me, he was my friend. And that was important to that kid. We're used to watching these kids, or at least let me say my experiences. I watch these kids on the news, on TV. But it is not my experience. And so we feel bad or whatever else. But that kid has to continue to live with those experiences the rest of their lives. So those are the kids that we actually have in our program. So the biggest definition when people think about trauma, think, people think about PTSD. And so I want to talk briefly about PTSD. It's Think about the word, post-traumatic stress disorder. It suggests something very key, post, it's over. My kids don't have post-traumatic stress disorder because most of the time the traumas are ongoing in their lives. It is just a part of their experiences that are ongoing. So when you look at PTSD, the words are the experience of exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violation. It's a very narrow definition. So a lot of times when I go places, they'll say, you know, we don't really need that much work. We only have about six or seven kids to meet the criteria for PTSD. I said, oh, really? That's all you got? Six or seven kids in this whole facility to meet the criteria. <laughs> and they're actually right. Because if you look at the definition is very narrow, and this is the expanded version, okay? It started out with basically war veterans, you know, and then they, you know, expanded it to women, so that could be people who were victims of assault. But when you look at that, it's very narrow. So many of our kids don't meet that definition. And the individual experiences it directly as a witness to whatever that event is, um, hears about it, you know, the, the traumatic event that occurred to someone else and hears graphic detail of that, or as a function of the work they do each and every day, they're exposed to traumatic events of others. And so this is our definition of PTSD. And what I tell people is my kids don't have PTSD, but 90% of them have SLS. How many of you are familiar with SLS? That is? Shitty life syndrome. <laughs> it means from for many of our kids, they have this whole contextual experience where in almost every area of their lives, there are things happening that are adverse and challenging and and really are not um, they're not in a position to be able to cope with those things. So what you know, if I sat down and I said, today we're gonna to do a PTSD group, I have zero kids that want to show up. But my group is called the SLS group. It's the shitty life syndrome group. And kids understand exactly what that means. And we're able to talk realistically about the things that impact them. So when we think about PTSD, we start talking about symptoms in this way. So intrusion and avoidance and negative alterations in cognition and views, hyperarousal reactivity and dissociation. So I'm not gonna talk about definitions for that in depth, but basically intrusion is you know, what happened to you, the things that you experience, elements of that pop into your head when you don't want them to. They just pop there, you know? So if you can imagine stuff just popping into your head and you're in school, you can't focus on that blackboard. I had a young woman who said, you know what? You know, she had been sexually abused by her mother's boyfriend for over three years. 
And he would come and pick her up from school under the auspices she was sick or mom needed something. And he would rape her in the abandoned buildings around the school. So when she got to be in high school, she was truant. She got picked up an assault charge for assaulting a school resource officer because she became so hyper aroused that he was going to see her through the windows that she felt the need to flee. And so that intrusion is important because of how she responds to that event for herself. Avoidance is basically avoiding anything that reminds you of that traumatic experience. And unfortunately, part of what that means is that some of our kids avoid emotion. They avoid connection. They avoid relationship because all of those things were associated with harm for them. And then we think about the mood issues that come, the, out, the alterations in cognition, which we're going to talk about in a moment. Hyperarousal reactivities, like are, they're on the balls of their feet all the time, prepared to act. That's really what this is. And then dissociation. Dissociation is one that um, I see a lot of time, and, and, and is often, more often, in the girls that I work with, which more or less is they're checked out. Their mind and body are in some way separated. They often say, you know, it's like I was floating in the air observing what happened to me. It was their mind escaping when they could not physically escape. And so when you think about dissociation, I had a young woman who said, you know, she said, Doc, do you daydream? And I said, no, I, I, I mean, you know, yeah, sometimes I guess. She said, well, do you feel like you live in a dream world? And I said, what does that mean? She says, it's like the world, there's stuff happening, but it's like I'm watching a movie. I don't feel like I can reach out and touch it. I feel like I am right here. This is the end of me. And everything out there doesn't feel real. And I said, you know, I've not had that experience, but many of the young people I work with who have been through what you've been through, they have that experience. We call it dissociation. It was your body's attempt to protect you from all the things that were happening to it. And so we could talk about it as a strategy, kind of as your body's way of coping. So I like to talk about symptoms, and some of these are relevant to the populations we serve, and though for that point, it's important. So what I call shitty life syndrome is actually very reminiscent of something called complex trauma. Complex trauma, the difference between PTSD and this word called complex trauma is that it's not a car accident. It's not one event that just happened in the context of everything else going well. This is repetitive and ongoing events that affect young people and happen within the developmental life span. So they often happen in the context of caregiving relationships or with other trusted adults. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a parent or, or care provider. And there's a significant impact on how that youth develops. So what's happening in some way affects other areas of development. And so when I look at kids and I look at what's happening, I often want to know at what ages things happen. Because the experience of that event in the context of development is critical to understanding. So many of my kids are what we call polyvictimized. So part of complex trauma means that there really is no escape. In every environment in their life, something is happening. So the school is not necessarily a safe place. They're being bullied or victimized, or they're not succeeding and they're put down for that. The home is not a safe place. So there are multiple places in their lives in which they will continue to experience um, all types of victimization, so we know that to be important. So this is a, I don't like to usually show a ton of research, but I want you to kind of just look at this graphically and think about. We know people say trauma bad, and I think, yeah, trauma bad. But what we understand is poly victimization is worse. So. An individual who experienced one type of traumatic event, even if it's the worst thing you can think of, a child that was sexually abused by some random stranger and made it home, but lives in the context of a caregiving um, environment where family is supportive, I almost don't need to see that kid. 
because there's a natural reparative piece. His school is going well. He's got a supportive community or she's got a supportive family is going well. That child has a better outcome. But as you add victimization and the more types of victimization you add, the higher the likelihood of that child experiencing all kinds of other difficulties like substance use, mood disorder. So to me, trauma is also a driver for so many other variables that we see that if we, don't, we need to really look at going back to see what components we can, we can impact in some way. So when we think about complex trauma, we talked about develop, uh, development, I want you to see these are the areas that get impacted by complex trauma. So these are the pieces. So that it affects attachment and relationship, which I think is, to me, the, the biggest piece and the most detrimental aspect of complex trauma. It affects biological and physical experiences. It changes the way a child thinks. It changes their whole world view in some way. Um, their ability to regulate emotion, all of these things, their self-concept, their view of what they have seen themselves in the future is impacted. So this is what we think about in terms of complex trauma. But like I said, the most important one I can think of is attachment and relationship. And when I say that, most people think that's only something that happens with parents. No. Attachment and relationship can happen in any, any situation that you are in. That relationship is critical. And so when I start talking to staff, and remember, I work with juvenile correctional officers. You know, many of them who said, I'm here to protect the community. That's what I'm here to do. And so we begin to talk about, if you really want to help kids, you can only do it in the context of relationship. So if you shout orders down on them, you, you're not doing anything in terms of the relationship. And so this becomes key to me. So this is a, an image, and you look at it. I just look at that young person's arm. And if you can read it, it says, trust nobody. And that's really like a motto for many of my kids. Because if I trust you and I let you in, you can hurt me. So I like for you to be out there where I have a greater sense of being able to control the situation. So, you know, those, those pieces where you validate, as you said, and that kid throws a jab back, that kid is attempting to push you back in a way. Because even the validation feels strange in some way. So attachment and relationships are a key piece of where I begin with young people. But our kids have a continued expectation of maltreatment or abandonment. They persistent distrust and suspiciousness of others. They're often isolated, withdrawn. They have trouble seeing from the other's perspective. Because to see from another's perspective requires you to have had a relationship and experience where another has seen from your perspective as well. It's something we show kids how to do. Um, and then social boundaries. We need to develop social boundaries in the context of relationships. It's our, it's our families, our communities, our churches, the places that we work with kids that teach that boundary. And we know that many of the kids we work with, or at least I work with, many of the relationships have a violence component to it. So I usually talk about relationships in terms of intimacy and talk about um, dating and other things because Many of my kids, when you look at it, the nature or quality of those intimate relationships, they often are marked, often are marked by a significant, significant level of violence. So I said that, that this changes cognition for our kids. When you look at this, I want you to focus on something we call the invisible suitcase. Everybody has some belief about self, the adults that care for them in the world. Our beliefs are developed in the soup of everything that constructs our lives. They are developed via um, the beliefs our parents have. Our parents transmit beliefs to us. Our community transmits beliefs to us. Our 
educational system transmits beliefs to us. So that's something that we construct. And we call it the invisible suitcase because everywhere a child goes, they carry these belief systems with them and they guide their behavior. So you can imagine a kid who's experienced significant trauma and you think about them coming into your program, some of them have these thoughts. It's all my fault, I'm bad, grown ups lie, you're gonna hurt me, no one loves me, get them before they get you, you're paid to care, and I'm no sucker. I've heard some of those things before. But you realize that if these are the cognitions that don't necessarily get shared though inside, those guide what the kid does. If a kid innately believes they are stupid, do you think they give great effort to school? If a kid innately believes that you're just here for the paycheck, do they have any sense that you have any desire to help them? No. But this is the, these are the cognitions that we're often working to change in some way. But we can't change them by just saying they're different. We have to act to demonstrate that they can be different. So one of my favorite is I had a kid that, you know, more or less believed he was stupid. And, and I told him, you know, he was supposed to be taking the um, uh, test in order to graduate from high school. And he said, I'm not taking that. I'm not taking that. My, my kids would say, I, I'm just not doing that. So why not? I said, I never passed, so why should I even bother to take it? And I said, oh, okay, well, tell me a little bit about, you know, how much school have you had? So I'm in high school, okay. Mm -hmm. How many days did you miss a school last year? Oh, a bunch. How many days of school did you miss in middle school? A bunch, okay. So we start going back and we construct the fact that while the child was technically in school, they actually missed a bunch of stuff. And so I said, you know what? I imagine that some of that stuff on that test is probably from things that you learned in school or were supposed to learn. And if you weren't present, you didn't have the opportunity to learn. So I know that there are days you don't want to talk to me. So instead of talking to me, how about this? We're just going to study for the math portion of that test. That's all we're going to do during the session. And he's like, and I don't have to talk about anything else. I said, no, nothing else. We're just going to work on math. So we worked on math for like six weeks, and I'm no math expert, but what you need to pass the test is not that great. We worked on six weeks. That kid passed, not by applying colors, the math section of the test. Do you think that began to change his belief system about himself? Of course. Do you think that also helped in terms of understanding that if there are opportunities, not all adults, but some adults actually care about you? and are invested in you. So that's a piece of what we do in order to change. And that has to be about legitimate work inside of relationships. So I want you to understand, we're gonna talk briefly about coping because it, it helps me to then talk a little bit about you know, what it means to be a trauma responsive system. So if you look at this definition of coping, a coping strategy is the behavior individuals use consciously or unconsciously to tolerate adversity disadvantage or disability without correcting or eliminating the underlying condition. And that was really a tough one for me because when the subcommittee for my curriculum came to me and said that, here's the definition of coping, I thought, how about you go back and bring me a different one? Because I don't like things that don't fix stuff. And then I had a very wise young person that told me, because we, we always have a youth on, on anything we do, and he said, um, so Mario was speaking, and he said, Doc, what's wrong? The, the, the definition's fine. And I thought, okay, what do you mean the definition is fine? I mean, it's bad. It's saying it's not going to fix stuff. And he said, well, if you think about all the stuff that's happened to me, if you think about that SLS you talked about, he said, the tools you gave me, the stuff we did in therapy, all that work, it's wonderful. But they're tools that just help me. Trauma is like a cloud. So it, it is over me many days. Sometimes that cloud is very, very dark and ominous. And I need to use the tools that you gave me to help me manage that cloud. Other days it's white and light and fluffy. And I don't need hardly any tools. 
but the cloud never goes away. That is exactly what the, the you can't make what happened to me go away. All you can do is give me the tools and to set me in experiences that allow me to grow, but it doesn't go away. And I thought, that is, kids are profound. When you give them a chance to speak, they can be mighty profound. And so I said, okay, we're gonna keep that, Mario, but only because of you. <laughs> so when I look at coping, I like for people to think about coping in a couple ways. Because when we think about coping, a lot of times we assign valence to it. We'll say that you're either doing, you have positive coping strategies or you have negative coping strategies. And so a lot of times in therapy, they'll tell people, well, you know what, we're gonna work on replacing your negative coping strategies with positive ones. And I like to avoid that because most of the time, the strategies my kids are using to cope are those they have to come up with on their own. So who am I to tell them they are negative coping strategies? I just say they're strategies. What I am able to say it sometimes is some of the things you do are not as healthy as they could be. So how, how do we come to a place where we can find strategies that don't jeopardize your health or well-being? Strategies are always adapted to the traumatic situation, meaning that we build strategies that work. And that's important to remember. There's sometimes considered maladaptive when the situation changes. So sometimes what we do is um, our kids develop strategies and ways of managing in the environments from which they come. When we move them to alternative settings, we expect them somehow to use different strategies. That doesn't happen. I have this tool. This is my toolbox. I don't have another toolbox. And so then it suddenly begins to look maladaptive. So I want you to think about coping from that perspective or, or strategies kids use. So if this is your life, if you're dealing with community violence and homelessness and you know potentially dealing with weapons, if you've been threatened, if you are physically abused, sexually abused, if you are witnessing domestic violence and you're seven and ten and twelve, what are the strategies that you could use to manage this? What does that seven and 10 and 12 year old do to manage these experiences? To survive? What are, they, what are some of the things that you might find that kids do? Maybe you dissociate, maybe you are you know, these things that happen to my body, I have no control over. But where my mind goes is the only thing I have. So, yes. What else? Physical illness. Huh? Physical illness. So, some of our kids may end up with physical illnesses. Correct. Their bodies and brains, you know, they have physical illnesses. What else do you do? If you, you hear this is your life. So, you know, I'm going to use drugs or alcohol because when I use those, I don't have to deal with this. My level of arousal and concern is different, okay? I have kids that say, you know what, I have nightmares you wouldn't believe. But if I smoke, do a little weed, a hit or two, and those go away, who am I to say that that's a negative coping strategy? It may not be healthy, but for the moment, it allows them to survive and sleep. That's important, too. Yeah. I have people in my weight management classes and uh -huh. one day I went around to ask what happened growing up. Uh -huh. All of them had trauma. Every single Every one. single one of the kids in your people in your weight management class. Yes. All so different traumas, so they all have traumas. So food, eating potentially, is a strategy. Okay. Yes. Uh, Reestablishing power whenever you go to school and you can survive. Right. So maybe utilizing violence as a way of protection. So violence can be a way of protection. And sometimes what we call proactive violence is a strategy to keep people away. So when new kids come into the facility, it's not uncommon that they attempt to establish their space. We expect it. They're going to fight. They're going to do everything they can to let everybody else know they're no punk. No, don't take advantage of me. It's a strategy, OK? So when we begin to see behaviors as strategies, then we have to say, how if we're going to provide an alternative, it needs to be something that's going to meet the same need, right? 
And so I used to laugh sometimes because I'm a psychologist and, you know, I know, you know, we teach deep abdominal breathing and we teach all these wonderful tools and they are wonderful tools. But these tools are not necessarily going to work in the same way as what the kid has been doing. And we just have to be honest about that. Nor are they the right tools in certain situations. And so we want to match that. So when we think about these are all the kids, things the kids that I know do. So they run. I don't know that it's maladaptive to run from abusive situations. Sometimes I don't think that's a maladaptive coaching strategy. Um, I don't think, you know, when you think about kids that join um, gangs, and we talk about gangs as families, but so in a very brief note, um, know that while this kid is a Latino or Hispanic kid in a gang, and that might be how you see it as traditional, I had the opportunity to listen to a person speak in Philadelphia a couple months ago that I really didn't want to go to hear him speak because his topic was that he was going to, to speak from the perspective of a recovering skinhead. And I thought, last I checked, I'm black, I am not going to that training, okay? But at the same time, when I listened to his story, if I didn't know he was white, it would be the story of all the kids I work with. Him joining that organization, that level of hate, wasn't about the fact, because he grew up in Philly. He said, I, I grew up in South Philadelphia, you know, where, where Fresh Prince is from. So I had black people, you know, I, I but, you know, before this, that's who I was. But that organization helped to meet a need inside of me for love, affection, connection, and then power and control. And I came from a strongly abusive family that nobody gave a darn about me. And these people listened to me. So we began to hear, for me, I had to say, you know what, that's the same story about the kids that I come from. So we begin to see it gets there in the same ways. We all have the same needs. So eating, we talked about, you know, sex maybe a piece. There's um, cutting serves a role, smoking serves a role, hitting serves a role. And I put that middle piece there, and there's a lot of controversy about why would you put a hanging kid? And the reality of it is, that's a coping strategy too. Some of our kids are highly suicidal. The ones that are most homicidal are suicidal. And so you recognize that coping is a strategy where I don't have to deal with anything else. That I, how do I make it through? And for some of our kids, that is how they think about it. So I want you to also recognize that, you know how they said, bugs don't breathe? They also say, oh, they don't commit suicide. I'm like, yes, they do. They do it in the most interesting ways. Sometimes with a lot of bravado, but it's still suicide. And so you really want to think about all of these variables. So um, a little bit about the what you can do now. So when we think about um, the kids that come into our system, when we rated the kids that come into any of our programs, the average numbers of different types of traumas our kids experience is almost five, okay? When you look at the most common type acknowledged, you probably can't read this, but isn't it interesting? It says trauma, loss, separation, bereavement. So that issue about losing people is really important. It's the most common experience for our population, much more so than even the rest of the things on that page. So we definitely have to address that. We know that kids who experience trauma and that are also in the justice system, that there's a high comorbidity, which means that they not only have potentially trauma histories and then some PTSD or complex trauma, but they also have mood disorders, anxiety-based disorders as well. And so we know that there's a high, a high likelihood of comorbidity. For those of you that do justice work, you've probably heard of this risk, need, responsibility principle. What it is is risk are all the things that happen or that you're aware of in an environment that contributes to the likelihood of delinquency. We know those things to be um, kids who are not attending school, kids that use substances, kids that have you know these beliefs or attitudes they consider to be criminogenic, uh, they have family environments that are not supportive and don't supervise. There are a number of what we call criminogenic risk variables. This one is 
very interesting because nobody, when I started doing this work, wanted to talk about trauma. And I was all about it. Because my, my thought was, something happened to these kids before they just randomly developed all these thinking patterns. So what we know is that exposure to greater than five adverse events, traumas, makes you 345% more likely to have early onset offending trajectory. So you are more likely to have that issue if you have the more events. How many events did I say the average number of kids we had, our kids had? 4.9, five, okay. So then there's the need principle, okay. So, and in this particular piece we say, okay, Need means what are the things that need to be addressed for that kid in order to uh, decrease their likelihood of coming back. PTSD symptom severity was really important in here. We know that the more severe the symptoms are, whatever those are, that, that it leads to an increased lifetime and past year delinquency rate. So we know that that drives it. So the severity of symptoms is important. And particularly what we call the arousal symptoms. So these could easily be called the rage symptoms. Because what happens with those is that those kids are more likely to have reactive aggression um, when we looked at male detainees. So what we're looking at is that those kids are responsive. They tend to be more aggressive in terms of their response. And then we think about responsivity. And so responsivity are one of the things that we kind of need to address. And so exposure to traumatic events, tends to lead to what we call acquired callous unemotional traits. And what we mean by that is that's that look that the kid, I don't care, I'm good, you can't hurt me, nothing's going to touch me. That's what we call callous emotional traits. The people I work with like to say, well, I don't know why you're worried with these kids, they're psychopathic. I thought, psychopathic? Really? We're talking about that? But what they're referring to is, this kind of inability to express emotion, this looking like they're shut down, they look very cold, that's what we call CU traits. But if this was your experience, I can understand how you could develop CU traits. It does not mean you're psychopathic or antisocial. You're actually probably doing something that, that is appropriate in some ways. PTSD dissociation symptoms, um, so the more of those, the more dissociative you are, the more emotionally dysregulated you are likely to be. So we know that the population that's more likely to have dissociation are our female population. And how many of you worked in the justice system? Like, have worked in facilities? Just a couple. I'll tell you that that is a population nobody wants to work with. You say, oh, we have a place on the girls unit. They're like, uh, I was really thinking of a different career the other day because, you know, they present with far more challenges than, um, or different challenges than potentially the boys. Another piece I want you to think about when we think about systems is we can never forget about the people that do the work. And in justice systems, we know that 92% of individuals say they had witnessed an act of violence by uh, a, a youth. 90% said they had witnessed an act of violence or aggression of a youth on another youth. And 81% said that they had restrained a youth in their program. And you look, 42% said we ourselves are experiencing PTS symptoms. So we have to acknowledge that the workforce is also impacted by their own traumas in childhood and growing up, as well as the experiences they have in our programs. And so Sometimes people want to preach to these folks and say, if you only would do what you're supposed to do, if you were a better teacher, a better officer, a better social worker, you wouldn't have to deal with this. And they don't realize that those people are also hurting. And so when I look system-wide, I recognize we have to address the needs of everybody that's a part of that system, not just the population we're serving, per se. So there is hope. Um, so I'm going to talk now a little bit about the what you can do. Um, the first part of what you can do, I want you to understand, is these are these are concepts: safety, empowerment, voice and choice, trust, cultural and linguistic responsivity, and then there's trauma-informed philosophy. So these are what I consider to be the building blocks or elements 
of a trauma response of practice. They're not just mine, they're also SAMHSA's and they're also Thrive's. We understand that these are the things that you do when you are trauma responsive. And so a first goal is physical and psychological safety. You can't even begin to be trauma responsive unless you are looking at safety. So when I look at programs, uh, I'm working, as I said, right now in Los Angeles County. If I go, when I go into some of the programs and I'm looking at the environment and I realize these kids don't feel safe, that's like step one. So we have to work on that first. We have to treat them with dignity and respect. So one of the pieces that has happened here when you think about it is the girls programs, um, the biggest complaint the girls had was we get used underwear. We get used underwear. And you think about that. Not many of us would want somebody else's underwear, particularly women, okay? So that was, that was such a critical issue. They had to figure out how do we do this differently? It seems like that would be a piece that you would want to address. So we think about safety, we think about empowerment, voice choice, we think about the way that we treat people. That becomes important. So how many, most of you have probably seen this special by Oprah, okay? When you looked at that and she talked about this treating trauma, and I have to say I was absolutely amazed because I actually thought that Oprah would kind of know more than she did. I'm like, she's like, this is groundbreaking. Oh, I'm out of time, okay. So what we learned from that was that relationships matter, okay? And if I can take two seconds, I'm just gonna show something very quickly. So if relationships matter, you begin to understand what's wrong with this picture. That this is the furthest from relationship you could potentially get, secluding a kid. And so I begin to help people understand we have to find a better way to manage or deal with kids. Very briefly, this is Candace Kilpatrick, a picture of the program that I'm currently working in. And I want you to think about, for those of you, um, that if we think about the core constructs of what's important, I want you to look briefly at this. What do you think this communicates to a kid when he pulls up? He probably is going to shut down, right? He's going to he's going to he's going to get ready. He's preparing. This is the new building front. Do you think that sends the same message? No. No. The goal is to not send that message. So this is this is the old camp, and you look at that, the rows. Now think about this is the new camp. It communicates relationship. There aren't 40 kids going down the road. There are six or eight dorm style beds, okay? There are areas to congregate and talk. That's part of how an environment can help. This is also campus compatible. So you begin to look at some of those pieces. What does this communicate? I mean, how many of you would disrobe and take a shower under those conditions? And we looked at kids doing this, not me, but it was looked at kids doing this every day like it was normal. We, we, it was okay to just take your clothes off in front of strangers. That wasn't exactly the thing we should communicate. You know, that you would go to the restroom and there would be no door. This is the new facility. So basic things like doors, privacy. This is the old facility. This is where visitation would have occurred. I know you're excited to have your family come and sit at these metal tables that don't move. This is a new area where we ask families to come. It communicates something different. And so part of what I try to expose to people is environment and how a kid comes in makes a difference. So which would you have for your kid if you had a choice? So thinking about those things. So I appreciate your time and I appreciate the opportunity.